Spring Hill Beef. Uh, we're in the Hunter Valley uh, on the Patterson River Road, uh, Patterson River, sorry, a um, couple of kilometres downstream from Lost Off Dam. Um, we run a bit of a mixed enterprise there. It's only a relatively small property, but we do do um, some cropping just for grazing purposes. Um, we run our breeders through our paddocks using regenerative practices um, and plant grazing. Um, the cattle are then, once we wean our cattle, we then put them onto our grazing crops where we grow them out for um, our branded beef brand, which we sell then direct to customers or through wholesale outlets. Um, so a bit about us, um, myself and Jody, our parents weren't farmers, so we didn't grow up, we didn't inherit a farm. Um, our grandparents were dairy farmers, so we did have a bit of a, an outlet into, into farming and stuff like that. Um, I used to spend a lot of my time, school holidays and stuff like that, was spent on my grandparents' dairy farm. So when we moved into regenerative grazing and, and planned grazing and stuff like that, um, moving cattle regularly wasn't something that was new to me. It was something that I grew up seeing. We always seen cattle get moved every day. Um, so that was nothing new to us. Um, yeah, so we started out, we bought a small property in Belford near Singleton. Um, then as we started growing our our beef business, we, we started leasing and adjusting properties, built up a herd, and then over the years we, we built it to a point where we could buy our own place, we sold a bit of stock to come up with a deposit, and then um, started growing at the new place at Spring Hill. So we got introduced to regenerative farming through um, a few courses that we did. We did a holistic management course at Tokau, and I also did the RCS Grazing for Profit course at Dubbo. Um, which was an eight day course, I think seven or eight day course, which was quite intensive. Um, we then implemented them practices on our farm. So we split up paddocks, uh, ran water lines, um, and started mobbing our cattle together and moving them around regularly. Uh, we also, this year was our first year, we started uh, multi-species cropping. So instead of following our paddocks, our cropping paddocks, we started sowing multi-species cover crops, uh, which we've had pretty good success with this year. Been a good season as well has helped. Um, we also we also do regular soil tests. Uh, we use a soil uh, a, uh, a foliar spray, which is we use a convert, which is basically like a seaweed and fish emulsion type mix that also puts other elements and stuff into the soil, which we've had great success with as well. Um, so our main focus with the the multi species cropping and stuff has been better water retention. Um, and we're also interested to see how this following crop goes. So a lot of the, a lot of the, the species in that multi-species crop were like cow peas, um, quite a few legumes. So there was a lot of clover and stuff as well. So we're hoping that there's more nitrogen going into the, the winter crop, which is being sown now, which is a winter wheat and clover mix. Basically why we use the regenerative practices is because it aligns with our beliefs and values. Um, We've also found from the direct sales of the beef that consumers are demanding to know more and they want to know that we're doing stuff to improve our land rather than, you know, conventional ways that sometimes are seen as, as harming the soil or, or the soil health particularly. So the benefits that we've seen through regenerative farming has been an increased carrying capacity for us. Um, by mobbing our cattle together, we can, we can actually carry more cattle. By resting paddocks longer, we're growing more feed, making more use of the water that we are getting, the rain that we are getting. Um, we are purely 100% grass fed at the moment. Um, during the drought, we did have to use a bit of grain to finish the cattle because we couldn't grow anything else. But other than that, we are grass fed. Um, minimising drought impacts. We believe that had we have started earlier, we would have been able to hold on longer into the drought. And we actually did where we were using the holistic management, we started putting higher density stock on and utilising that rank of feed with a supplement, the cattle still did quite well. Um, reducing erosion, which is something we're really focusing on now, as you can see, we're in quite hilly country. Um, so some of the gullies are quite eroded from previous management. And we have actually just got a, a grant with local lands to develop some erosion control and stuff like that in the gullies. Uh, increased biodiversity, so bugs, dung beetles, um, worms in the soil, birds, everything. Like we focus on, on a whole diversity of our um, livestock and animals in that, that system. Uh, increased water storage, which is something that we really 
aim to achieve is to store as much of the rain. When we do get rain, we want to store as much of that in our soil rather than have it run off or go anywhere else. We want to store it there so that hopefully we can hold on during them drier times, especially if the climate's supposed to do what, what, what they're showing earlier. So how we implemented the practices, so we split our paddocks, basically using steel end assemblies and, and steel posts and wire. Um, we invested in a pretty big electric fence energizer, which powers our whole property. Uh, we ran water, so we ran polypipe all along our fence lines so that we had um, dedicated water points in, in each property, so that they, in each paddock, sorry, so that they weren't having to walk far for water. We then started planning our rotation, so we used Maya grazing as, as one of our management tools which is what you can see down the bottom there of our property all split up into its paddocks. Um, as we move the cattle around, it puts a little icon on where the cattle are on them paddocks. It then also tracks how long you give them paddocks a rest period, uh, what sort of grazing you gave them, so you can sort of monitor how much pressure you're putting on each paddock. Um, the feed budgeting, we use my grazing for our feed budgeting. So we're, we're trying to plan six, eight, 12 months in advance of how much feed we've got on, on stock. Um, and I think going into droughts and out of droughts, that will give us the tools to be able to make better decisions quicker and hopefully beat them market spikes or, lo or drops um, and hopefully increase our profits. Um, stock density. Stock density is another thing that we focus on. So in our growing season, we back the stock density off a bit so that they're mainly only picking the better quality pastures in that paddock, but we let them have one bite, move them on. We don't let them come back for a second bite and we don't we don't want them to eat the lower quality feed. So basically we're trying to stimulate them higher, the higher quality pastures and stimulate them to grow and then move them on. So we monitor, in our growing season, we monitor the higher quality pastures. Once they've been eaten to where we want them to be eaten to, we move them on after that. Um, in winter, we will box them up tighter so the density will get higher, um, but that's to utilise that, that rank of feed that again, we can put out the, um, the supplement licks and, and still keep them going along well. So the tool we, tools we use, like I said, my grazing system, which if no one's seen, this is one of their, one of their systems within my grazing. It's matching your stocking, stocking capacity to, or your stocking rate to your carrying capacity. So your, it's directly tied to your rainfall. So the more rain you get, the highest um, carrying capacity you're going to have, the less rainfall you get, the lower carrying capacity you're going to have. So we use this in the drought and we destocked based on our our um, stocking rate being over our benchmark, so tied to the rain we were overstocked. That made us, helped us make the decision instantly that we needed to destock to the point where we come back under that benchmark. Um, the yellow section of that's just, you can, um, you can plan forward to where you expect to be, as far as your carrying capacity and what rain you expect to have. So that's just one I put in there for this photo, but we just put where our stock will be, uh, fully stocked, and an average rainfall basically over the next um, 12 months and what that'll look like. So. Um, again, coming into the next drought, it'll be a tool that we use uh, pretty heavily, but it's something that we monitor all the time. Education, of course, was another tool that we used. So we did the RCS Grazing and Farming for Profit. We've also done a holistic management course. We've done several other ones as well along the way, shorter courses and stuff like that. Soil testing is something that we're constantly monitoring um, to see if there's anything that we do need to add to our pastures. Um, recently. We did a soil test that showed we needed a few things. So we have spread chicken manure. Uh, we've also got a foliar spray that's going out shortly. Um, so yeah, that, that should rectify any issues we have there. So this was our place during the drought. It probably doesn't look too dissimilar to most places. Um, it's actually a pretty hard picture to look at now when you see what we're in now. But, um, it affected us pretty heavily, as you can see, we had no feed, there was nothing left. We had water, we were lucky because we are on the Patterson River and it's pretty reliable water. So we had water but we had no feed. So what you can see there is the cattle getting fed, they were for our meat sales um, and that was all we had left pretty well. We had a few calves down on a creek flat that were getting um, just supplement fed DDG pellets and some silage just to keep them going through. Um, but predominantly everything else was sold off. What decisions we made were basically going back to that stocking rate to rain for. We, we realised that we were overstocked and we looked forward at our feed budget and there was no feed to budget. It was all gone. So we knew straight away then it was either feed for an unknown time um, or destock. And we made the decision for us to destock. Um, 
pretty pretty quickly. What tools we used again for the drought was basically that, that stocking rate to rainfall and the feed budgeting. They're the two tools that we used to help us make the decision. Feed budgeting, which I touched on. Uh, irrigation, so during the drought we, we, we set up an irrigation set up. It was only over about 15 acres, but we seen that as a way that we could potentially feed a number of head to get us through, um, especially for the meat sales, so that we could still hold on to something and could still grow some feed. So that's all been set up now and that's operational. Um, so that will help us into the next drought as well. The, diversi the diversifying section of our business. So we started doing farmers markets. We started um, selling direct online. Um, we sent all our, all our meat was sent, all our cattle was sent to curry for processing. Um, then they were sent back to a local butcher who cut all the beef up and cryovacked it. And then we would label it all, uh, weigh it all and label it all and then put it in our little cool room and off we go to the, the farmers markets or deliver it to people who'd ordered online. Um, we, all, we delivered predominantly um, Newcastle, Central Coast, Hunter Valley and Port Stephens area. So it was all sort of within, within sort of two or three hundred kilometres of home. Uh, we didn't really push into Sydney um, just because we didn't have the time to get down that, that way, but we certainly did have a fair bit of demand to go down that way. Other options for diversifying are carbon, uh, soil carbon credit potential. So, We've been looking a bit lately, I don't know if anyone's um, familiar with the Wilmot Cattle Co, but they just did a half a million dollar deal with Microsoft, selling some of their soil carbon that they, they stored. Um, and I think going forward, that's gonna be something that a lot of producers could look at, is how they can store more carbon in their soil and, and the potential return they can get from that. Um, another option for diversifying is stacking enterprises. So this is, this is running cattle and sheep, or cattle, sheep, pigs, cattle, sheep, chickens. Um, there's a lot of guys doing this in the sort of Central Coast, Newcastle area um, that are doing quite well off a very small, small property. Um, they're producing a lot, of, a lot of product. There's a guy out west of Sydney that's doing, um, I think it's three tonne of protein a week off 100 acres. Um, and he sells all that through butchers in, in Sydney. So it's quite impressive. Um, social media is something that we, we started a long time ago. Basically, we seen it as a way to keep a diary. So if we were putting fertiliser on a paddock, we'd put it on Facebook and then we knew what date we, we fertilised that paddock. It was a way of tracking for us what we were doing and what dates that happened, when calves were getting born, when the bull went in, when the bull went out. And it just built a bit of momentum and people started following it and keeping an eye on what we were doing and then asking us questions and, and it's just grown from there. Um, I'm a big believer that as producers, we all have a responsibility to show people how and why we're producing what we're producing um, and consumers really want to know. So they want to know the reasons why we're making certain decisions and, and the reasons we're doing things the way we're doing. So the more we can open up and be, be honest and open about what we're doing and why we're doing it and what we're producing, I think the better for the whole industry. Um, and the last one, direct to the resellers and outlets. Um, that's predominantly where we're focusing now. We don't do farmers markets anymore because we just didn't have the time to be running around to farmers markets and we do have a young family so weekends are quite important to us. But we have been speaking to a few butchers in Sydney um, and throughout the Hunter Valley and also a pretty large retail that's interested in stocking our, our packaged beef products. So um, yeah, quite a few exciting things there that potentially coming online. Right, eh? That's pretty much it. So, anyone questions and answers? If anyone wants to contact us with any questions or wants to follow us to keep up to date with what we're doing, um, by all means, I'm, I'm always available. Um, other than that, that's it. <laughs>